folks were over for Memorial Day. And we just began very lightly talking about it in between sips of uh, beer and watching the kids, you know, do belly flops in the pool, uh, about what, you know, we might ha- what might happen and what we might do. We didn't make a plan. We didn't convene a meeting. But we, we had a basis for discussion because, you know, it's it's impossible to avoid the sense that something could happen. And Southern Californians are always kind of a little bit leery of the next quake. We've had a bunch of quakes here recently, nothing destructive, but, you know, it raises the hackles. And, um, you know, what would ha- happen in Haiti and Chile and, and Iceland, and uh, as you said at the very beginning of the show, it's on the top of people's minds. So it's not a bad time to, to discuss, discuss these things. Okay, let's take some calls here. We'll go to uh, Grand uh, Chute, uh, Wisconsin. Scott, first-time caller. Go ahead, Scott. Yes. Um, good morning, Mr. Norrie and Mr. Joseph. Good morning. Thank you good morning. for taking my call. I'm, I'm going to take you back to where you were talking about the Earth's magnetic field shifting, and I'm wondering if um, because we're approaching the center of the Milky Way galaxy, whether um, going above or below the axis of the center of the Milky Way galaxy could have some effect on our poles shifting magnetic, uh, the the magnetic poles shifting. And also, um, has there ever been a a theory that the sun has has magnetic poles and maybe it can develop magnetic poles spontaneously that could shift the Earth's magnetic pole? And my second question is, um, what do you think uh, philosophers such as Einstein or our Buckminster Fuller would have to say today? Uh, I I happen to have a chance to meet uh, our Buckminster Fuller twice, and I've read a couple of his books. The last book that I read by him was Utopia or Oblivion, The Prospects for Mankind. Wow. Well, that's quite a quite a set of questions there. Thank you. The let me take the second part of the first question first, and that re- re- concerns the, the relationship of the sun's magnetic field, and indeed it does have a magnetic field um, to the Earth's magnetic field. And that's your question puts us right at the cutting edge of of contemporary science. Um, there's all the knowledge that we've ever acquired about the sun is being doubled, I'd say, monthly now, because in 2007 to 2008 was the, was the International Heliophysical Year, the year devoted to studying the sun, and, and um, that in, in included uh, at least half a dozen um, spacecraft and satellite launches devoted to studying the sun and the sun-Earth relationship, and, uh, and certainly important among them is the relationship of the, how the sun's magnetic field uh, relates to the Earth. I think we don't know yet. I mean, I think there's lots of speculation, but I think it's, it's the, the data are coming in. What we do know is that the sun flips its magnetic poles every 22 years, every second cycle. Uh, and 2012 happens to be uh, the year when the sun is expected to flip its, mag- its, its uh, magnetic poles. And this particular time when it's going to flip its poles, um, is according to the the group of NASA researchers who worked on the FEMIS, the the group of five uh, solar research satellites that discovered the gaping hole in the magnetic field, they believe that this time we are going to be faced with a, a terrific magnetic onslaught from this flip in polarity. Basically, think of it like this: you have two magnets, both uh, north poles. You're holding them together. And it's hard to keep them together. They don't attract. They repel. Well, lots of lots of, um, um, of charge builds up between those magnets. All of a sudden, you flip one of the magnets to the south, and, and they snap together. That is directly analogous to what's going to happen in 2012. And all this, this uh, charge that's built up over the last uh, 22 years between the Earth and the sun is going to flip. Is, 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 is instead, of, instead of being caught in limbo between the two, those two bodies, the Earth and the Sun, is going to rush towards the Earth. And I was surprised. I thought that it would rush toward the Sun, the Sun being the, 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 the greater attractor. But no, this charge is built up directly outside of the Earth's atmosphere, 
And the law of magnetic attraction is that it's proportional, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between two objects. So it's close enough to the Earth where it's, it, the Earth is, is, is a more powerful attractor than the sun. So it's going to rush into our, uh, our planet, and it's going to rush through our, the Earth's magnetic field. And again, if, if you're interested, the article is called Giant Breach in Earth's Magnetic Field. It's NASA, science at nasa.gov. Tell me about some of these geomagnetic resistors you've, you've been talking about. How will they help the power grid from melting down? Oh, it's, it's, it's a thing of beauty. It's so, so simple. Um, basically what happens, a, a solar blast comes in, hits the Earth, goes through the magnetic field, goes into the ground, okay? All right. And then some of, the, some of that, that, that charge, that current, comes back up from the ground, uh, really only a few volts per square meter, and then hits the transformer and fries the transformer both because the transformer can't handle the extra current, but mostly because it's direct current, and our system is built on alternating current. So it, it mucks it up and it fuses it. What, we, what you have to do is you take the, the surge suppressor, stick it in between the ground and the transformer, so when this current comes up, the surge suppressor uh, absorbs it and protects the transformer. It's great. It's 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 beauty in simplicity. It's a, it's a <laughs> When it works. Yeah, apparently uh, so, yeah. More calls here. We'll go to Tom in Chicago. Hi, Tom. Go ahead. Hey, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the book Revelation is really dear to me. Um, it, it helped me through a very difficult time in my life. I've been studying the Bible since I was 17, and it was the book I was reading in the chapel when my wife died, childbirth, 21 years old. And um, later in my life, I had it. I think there's something to the gases in the cave and the transcendent state of the mind, understanding and, and writing that kind of uh, metaphysical book. I had an experience that doctors described as a, as a uh, self-induced acid trip, basically. I never touched drugs. And it did put me in transcendent state. And, and the book actually opened up in a way as though John was sitting there describing it to me personally. Uh, I could say that uh, for good news, everything is going to turn out incredibly wonderful, uh, more than we can imagine. And I just documented all of it in the book. And I'll look for an email on you, Lawrence, and get it to you if you're interested. Oh, please. Yeah, it'll be in a word file, and you could uh, just open it up and uh, save it or print it or whatever. Well, every, everything that's sent to lawrenceejoseph.com gets to me. That's it. And I'd really appreciate that. And you know what? Um, I hope that you get a chance, if you haven't already, to go to the Cave of the Apocalypse because I, I would be surprised if you didn't have the kind of experience that only uh, very few people can actually uh, attain in this lifetime. Would you call that experience mystical, magical? What, what would you call it? Me? Yeah, you. I would. I, I, and I, I'm sure that this caller, with his, his deep affection and affinity for the Book of Revelation, um, would be would find himself transported to uh, what could be called the divine realm, or at least uh, that's my hope for you. And I, you know, I think what happens, I hope you get to go. Camden, New Jersey, we go. It's Yusuf's turn. Good morning, Yusuf. Yes, um, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure thing. Okay, I got a um, two-part two question. The first question I have is, what is the relationship with Jesus as far as, the return of him on earth um, in reference to 2012, and if there's anything in the Quran or the Bible that states anything about 2012. And my second question is, how are all the other countries as far as, um, like the Middle Eastern countries, um, what, what are they media talking about as far as 2012? Okay, uh, let, me, let me take the last one. I don't think uh, many Middle Eastern countries are talking about 2012. Lawrence? Are they? I haven't seen it. Um, no. re recently, I, I got a call to do a talk show in Lebanon, um, but um, that I think that's the outlier exception, you know. And, and Lebanon is, is, is also kind of its own. Does the Bible or the Quran, if you know it, say anything about 2012? No, I don't believe it does. And, and in my first book, I talked about how the Bible Code, which is a, a book by Michael Drosnan, which uh, mm -hmm statistically analyzes and makes kind of a, a big acrostic out of the Bible. Uh, in, in, in that form of analysis of the Bible,